going to be talking about you know, formulation and understanding formulations um, and uh, just some general ins and outs of, you know, the types of formulations that you may come across uh, you know, in your daily work, but also just some, some reminders and key points about uh, tank mix compatibilities and mixing orders. I saw that question, and so we'll get into that here uh, in a minute or two. Uh, before that, let's, uh, I want to do a safety share, as we always like to do at FMC. It's about using box cutters. Um, you know, this time of year, you may be kind of stocking up on supplies and ordering a lot of things to get ready for the, for the, the coming season, or you're still kind of making applications, although depending on where you are, or just be, may, might not be as busy of a season, but you're still having um, supplies coming in. So um, I think first and foremost, uh, you know, these types of things, you know, we do it so often, sometimes we forget about general safety um, when we're using box cutters. It's always a good idea to wear gloves. Um, if you have cut resistant gloves, that's certainly a positive. Uh, you wanna make sure the blade is sharp. You know, the benefit of a sharper blade is it's not gonna tug and pull, it's gonna cut. So it's gonna be easier to uh, have control of that blade. You know, dull knives or dull blades, box cutters, uh, can slip and can cause injury as well. I'm sure you're aware that there are a lot of um, box cutters that you can adjust the, the length of the blade that comes out of the, the handle. Uh, so in uh, these types of situations, you want to make sure that you kind of shorten the blade, keep it uh, short. So, um, you know, you, you don't have, you don't need two inches of a, of a blade to be going coming out of the box cutter if you're just cutting tape and things like that. So the less exposure that of a blade, the less likelihood it's going to cause a deep cut if it does slip, but also the less likelihood that it's going to um, cause damage to whatever's in the box that you're trying to open. Uh, making sure when you're holding the box cutter, you're positioning your thumb away from the blade. Move your other hand up away. It's good to make sure that it's out of the cutting path and you're bracing you know, the box or whatever you're trying to open, but it's not in that cutting path. Angle it away from your body. So what that means is you don't want to try to, you don't want to cut into your body. Um, if you're looking at a, a box, say for example, you know, you position it to where you, your, the cut is coming at an angle away from your body, not towards your body. Um, and then make sure you're applying that consistent you know, pressure when you're performing the cut. Uh, some of the other things that you may consider, especially if you're, con you're opening up larger containers, uh, maybe consider cutting halfway, um, make adjustments to where you know, you're not, uh, or your body, the trunk of your body is not in harm's way uh, of that, uh, that cut plate. So just kind of keep those in mind. Um, we're doing these kind of general things that we do every day. Okay. Um, so from a formulation standpoint and applications, we've certainly come a long way. You know, you know, we've gone from, you know, making these types of applications out in the field, uh, very messy type applications. Notice the, the lack of PPE uh, as well uh, in this picture. Uh, to a lot more advanced uh, types of application technology and techniques. And that's not only is it with um, the type of equipment that you're using, but also in the formulations that we're using. Um, there's a lot of really interesting technology that's out there in uh, the formulations that, that we use today. You know, kind of looking at some of the history of the, the, the pesticides you know, it actually goes back well before, uh, you know, the, the BC, 2500 BC, the, the Samaritans used to uh, mine sulfur to control insects. Um, you fast forward that through, you see in early AD where you see uh, the use of the pyrethrum flowers to propel and control certain insects. Of course, first ag chemical comp uh, uh, was used called Paris Green. It's, it's an insecticide used to control the Colorado potato 
uh, beetle. And then you've got the, other, the advancement of other things that uh, botanicals and things of that nature that, that come into play from an insecticide standpoint. As things advance, certainly see the introduction of other uh, chemicals. Uh, a lot of these are not available anymore because they, you know, like the organophosphates, there's very little, if any at all, nowadays using them. Maybe there may be one OP still used in turf these days, but not a whole lot. And as time goes on, you begin to see uh, the use of um, pesticides being uh, broader, uh, the spectrum was broader, formulations changed a lot, a lot of dusts or wettable powders, more liquid applications, um, and less corrosive uh, uh, formulations over time. The pest, you know, the term pesticide, you know, if, you, if you're familiar with FIFRA, you look at, uh, you know, what that definition is. It's basically any substance uh, or mixtures of substance uh, intended for you know, preventing or destroying, repelling, or mitigating any pest. That can be in a situation where, um, you know, or if you're trying to protect a certain plant, uh, trying to pr pr protect a specific structure, all of these things, you know, and it could be also substances um, that are used as a plant growth regulator, a defoliant, you know, if, you, if you're talking about from an ag standpoint, uh, uh, and so forth and so on. So it's a pretty broad definition. Um, it's defined by the best uh, the FIFRA section 2.0 U, that is. If you break it down into what a formulation itself is made of, first and foremost, you have the active ingredient. Uh, and that's what is actually uh, targeting the specific weed or insect or disease. And that's what's going to provide the efficacy that you're looking for. You know, towel star, for example, it's an insecticide. So if you're going after chinch bugs or, or uh, lepidopteran species and things of that nature. The bifenthrin in that in that uh, formulation is the molecule. That's the active ingredient. Uh, in order for that active ingredient to be able to uh, be applied in an easy uh, way, it ends up being a formulation. And you have a lot of different inert ingredients that help keep that molecule uh, in the formulation. Because one thing you don't want is you don't want to have a formulation that um, comes together in the development process, but once it's in storage, uh, over time it falls out of, of uh, suspension, and form these hard layers and things of that nature. That's not what you want. So you have things like, you know, towel stars, mostly water, 92% water, I think. You know, you have emulsifiers, solvents, and other ca and dry carrier material stabilizers. You know, all of these things. It's not just what's in. This is. Um, these are just all examples, by the way. It's not what's in Talstar. It's just examples of what inert ingredients are. Um, so the inert ingredients are essentially there to help with keeping that active ingredient stable uh, in the formulation. Um, you know, what's the you know the, the point or the purpose of an act of an inert ingredient you can convert a highly concentrated waxy solid or liquid uh, or solid mass to a usable form so that's a different way of kind of, of saying you know we're taking a, a block of solid active ingredient and we're converting that into a usable form that you can dilute in water because a lot of times, when you're dealing with raw active ingredient or technical material, they say, they call it, uh, it's in a highly concentrated form. It comes in, could be in a block, it could be in a powder form. Um, but the formulation and the inert ingredients helps break that down to where you know, it can be in, a, in that two and a half gallon jug or whatever it is that you're buying. Um, it helps with product. Uh, Handling, uh, 
makes measuring and mixing pesticides easier. So you're going from a 90 something percent active ingredient down to a, uh, you know, a 7.9 percent active ingredient product because of the, the inerts that are able to keep that um, active ingredient in a usable form. It makes the product a lot more safer uh, and it reduces the toxicity. You know, sometimes we get the question that, you know, when we are registering a product for the to the EPA, it's the final formulation that is that we do our uh, analyses on, and that's what um, that's what gets uh, reported in to the, to the EPA. Um, and also, you know, it makes the AI work. You know, there's different inert ingredients that you can add to formulations that improve the penetration uh, of the active ingredient can improve the distribution of that active ingredient and potentially make it more selective. Meaning, you know, if there's an active ingredient, there's some technologies out there that can make a product safer on a particular plant species. Uh, there's also increased effectiveness. There's, there's inert ingredients that you can add to a formulation that, that will allow that product to be more effective using less material or less active ingredient. So a lot of things you can do uh, within, with, with inert ingredients. Um, if you're comparing uh, the particle sizes of various formulations, you've got an, an EC, and we'll kind of go over some of these for detail. You know, emulsifiable concentrate, EC, suspension concentrate, a micro cap, and a micro emulsion. So you compare an EC formulation, um, you're at 2.95 microns as far as the particle size goes. Micro emulsion, you're at 0.03 microns. So a vast difference there you know, between an EC formulation uh, and a micro emulsion. So that's, that's some of the differences that you see in uh, these formulations that we're using. A lot of the formulations that, that are used in the turf market today uh, are, are typically SC formulations or you know, some type of soluble liquid formulation. Uh, you certainly have granulars and things like that, but of these here, from the VECs uh, are very uh, common. Now, the things to look for when you're look, when you're selecting a formulation, because you may have two or three different products, uh, and they have different formulations. So, how do you know what to pick, what to go from where? Right. So, I think you have to you know, do what you can uh, to evaluate the advantages and disadvantages of each formulation. You know, why why are there two formulations? Okay. Talk with your distributor reps and, and your basic manufacturer people. Uh, those available, you know, talk to them about you know right, what's the difference. You know, what are, what are pros and cons of each formulation? Because you need to understand how that's going to fit into your business. Okay. Uh, can the formulation be applied uh, when and where it's needed? Because a change of formulation sometimes means. Um, you may not be able to apply it in this specific area or location that, that the old formulation or the other formulation can or used to be. Um, are you going to have the same efficacy uh, in, our, in residual of that formulation? Or is there, due to the change of the formulation, does it break down faster? Um, does it require more active ingredient? And then do you need to make any changes to application equipment by switching to a different formulation? Um, a lot of times, I think commonly you see uh, certain formulations you may have to change your nozzle size or your mesh, your screen uh, size. It's because of, you know, again, going back to that particle size, if you're going from a smaller particle size to a larger particle size, um, or even just a Probably a better example would be from a soluble formulation to say a WDG. Um, you know, if you've got too small of a screen in your in your um, nozzles, you may get some clogging issues there. So you may just have to 
make some adjustments on your mesh size there. Um, I think a couple of things to think about when you're looking for, for a new formulation uh, performance, um, and that's both, um, you know, does it control the, the pest that you're going after? You know, whether it's a, a disease, an insect, or a weed, is it efficacious? Um, uh, is it safe on, on the turf? Is it safe to the ornamentals if you're making ornamental applications? Um, those are things that you want to make sure that, that are in place you know, before making that switch. Uh, is it easy to use? Uh, is it, you know, and that's also the, about, is it met, is it, can you measure it easily? Does it mix easily? Does it spray the way you want it to spray? Because those are very important. You know, anytime, and you know this better than I do, but any anytime you have to make an adjustment to your equipment um, because you're making a formulation change, that, that can really slow things down and it can be, uh, you know, more cost, effect, more cost, uh, uh, more costly, is what I'm trying to say. Sorry. Um, you know, do you have to, from a storage standpoint, uh, looking at different storage uh, requirements? Do you have to do specific storage requirements with with certain formulations and in package size? You know, it's, you've got package sizes rain, ranging from, you know, the smaller, you know, sulfonylurea type herbicides that are in like an ounce and a third packet to two and a half gallon jugs to even larger depending upon how much product you use. So uh, storage stability and package size, excuse me, storage uh, requirements and package size can become a, a big part of that. You know, here's a good example of formulation enhancements. This was really based on some feedback that we've gotten from our, from our customers. So we have Solitaire WDG, we have Solitaire WSL. Um, Solitaire, both products are, are, are fine products. They're great general weed control products, post-emergence weed control products, or whether you're going after grasses, broadleaf weeds, or sedges. Um, you know, it's very effective on, on a broad spectrum of weeds. Uh, but you know, one of the, the challenges in certain situations, um, there, you know, people just had a hard time keeping the WDG agitated, especially in backpack sprayers or ride-on sprayers and things like that. So we developed this solitaire WSL, which is a water-soluble liquid, and it's essentially clear once it, once it gets mixed in water. It doesn't take a whole lot of inversions to get it into to solution, um, and it is clear, it is there. And uh, this is uh, mixed in water, by the way. It's not the formulation itself, but it's mixed in water. Uh, so it's a very good fit for backpack applications, ride-on sprayers and things like that, where it's a lot more difficult to have consistent agitation compared to your bulk sprayers uh, when you're dealing with like a two to 300 gallon tank, where you have that built-in kind of agitation system. Um, we talk about tank mixing um, nowadays, uh, and you know it's been going on for quite some time, right? Is that we try to do as much as we can uh, you know, in as little visits as possible, because you've got a tremendous amount of area to cover, especially if you've got multiple trucks, multiple routes. Um, Every time you have to go back on that property, it's, it costs money. So very common to, to come in and, and provide tank mixtures, or you have some systems where they're um, the specialized systems where you have the bulk tank mix, and then you have the specific nozzle that will only apply certain active ingredients. So it's pretty advanced out there, as you know. Um, and I think there's a couple of things to keep in mind with tank mixes. One is being aware of and understand each product label. Okay. 
uh, and follow that because there, there are going to be certain things on those labels. You know, the question earlier was about fertilizers uh, and, and mixing order there. There are certain products that will say, you know, if you're using a liquid fertilizer as your carrier, then you need to do this and mix it in this order. And you have other products that don't say anything about uh, fertilizer carrier. So I would say, you know, that's where the jar test is very important. Um, when you don't have specific language, say making those statements clearly on the label, you know, a, a jar test will be important, you know, because in some situations, if you add the fertilizer first and then the active ingredient, you can get precipitates forming and that's what clogs your screens and your filters. Uh, I've seen that happen uh, a couple of times where um, they added the, for the fertilizer first and then they added the product. It, it clogged up the, the, the whole uh, system. So they did a jar test. They reversed the order. They added the product first, then the, the, the fertilizer and everything was OK. Uh, so it just depends on the formulation. Some formulations go in the, in the solution or suspension fine and there's no incompatibility there. There's other products that have specific instructions on that label to say, okay, if you're using a liquid fertilizer as a carrier, you know, then you need to do this first. So really pay attention to the label and what it says there. Uh, a lot of times you'll see this mixing order uh, on a label. Uh, you know, if you remember, you know, it used to be the old acronym WHALES. Uh, and this could apply to a jar test as well. Um, you know, you have the wettable powders or water dirt, dispersible granules first, agitate it, um, and then you add your liquid flowables, so your your um, suspension concentrates, your SC formulations, then your emulsifiable concentrates, and then your 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 soluble liquid products. If um, you need an adjuvant like a surfactant or something like that, my suggestion would be to add it at the end uh, because a lot of times, you know, if you add that too early in the process, you can get a bunch of foam develop and things of that nature. I mean, there are some defoaming agents that you can buy to, to mitigate that, but typically, you know, that's where you would add your adjuvants. And then also with that, pay attention to the labels and the products that you're mixing because there may be uh, products where they will say on the label that this formulation has a built-in surfactant or it says, all right, you need to add this type of surfactant. Uh, the question, the challenge becomes is if you're mixing products that say one says you need an adjuvant, the other one says an adjuvant is not recommended. So that's where you have to just kind of go off on a little, a few things to further educate and understand, okay, well, you know, do you have time to do a spot, spot treat test before the season begins or before, you know, something happens, before you go full force with that mixture to really understand what it would do uh, from a progress tolerance standpoint or an efficacy standpoint. Um, but, I think in those situations, the quicker answer would be to kind of check with your distributor rep and, and uh, the manufacturer themselves to really figure out what's going on when, when you see those types of statements. So just, again, be familiar with the label. Keep those things in mind. Because uh, we certainly don't want to get into something like this. Uh, this is a very good example of an incompatibility of two uh, products that were mixed in a tank that created this foam type precipitate that really clogged up the system. Um, there's a lot of good references and resources like this um, out there. I'm sure this one just happens to be from Purdue University uh, that you can, uh, I'm sure you can order this online. It's a little booklet that they, they publish about uh, avoiding tank mix errors. If you have something like that, I would I would suggest you invest in that. Typically, they're not that expensive, so uh, but really want to make sure we avoid these this kind of stuff. 
So I think we'll do a couple of things for the rest of the time. It's just going to go over some general um, types of uh, formulations and uh, kind of go after some advantages and disadvantages of, of different formulations. This one, uh, you know, a soluble liquid. Um, these are these are products that form a true solution uh, when they're mixed. Okay, so an example of the product, the actual product when it comes out of the jug compared to when it's diluted in water. See straight through it. There's no cloudiness. So that's what you that's where you know you're dealing with a true solution. So it goes in the solution. Um, and if you leave it there, there's not going to be any kind of settling out or anything like that. Um, you see over here, it truly dissolves in water. Sugar in water is a, is a true solution. Uh, you know, we talked about solitaire WSL being a uh, product um, uh, similar to like what we have in, uh, in our portfolio would be a true solution. Advantages of uh, solutions or soluble liquids. Uh, uh, these, they're easy to handle typically. Don't need any agitation. Maybe, you know, if you're dealing with a backpack, you know, a couple of inversions of a backpack or, or just the kind of a swirl of a backpack is pretty much all you need to make sure it's evenly distributed uh, through the tank. Um, you know, if you're doing a ride on the application, that soluble liquid as you're moving across a property, um, it's going to get agitated enough to get into solution there. Um, typically easy on, on equipment uh, because there's no uh, harsh um, petroleum distillates or anything like that you may find in other, other formulations. So you don't have to worry about, you know, gaskets or, or any kind of rings corroding or anything like that. Um, there's no real residue um, and it can be used indoors and outdoors. And that, that's referring to in general. So just want to make sure you're not, not saying like a cow star, even though that's not a soluble liquid, it can be used indoors, but there are soluble products that can be used indoors and outdoors. Um, solitaire obviously is an outdoor product. Um, Disadvantages, uh, the pH of the dilution water. So here's one where you have soluble liquids, where if it, the pH gets too out of whack outside of that, you know, five to seven, five to eight range, that's where you really have to, may have to buffer that down or, or increase the, the, the pH depending upon what your water source is. And typically what can happen in some in situations like this is that, um, with weak acids or, or, or soluble liquids, you can, as a lot of times as the pH increases, solubility increases. And with certain active ingredients, that can mean two things. It can mean you're really going to see an increased efficacy on the weeds, but you're also going to see an exacerbated a negative effect on turf grass. So you're really going to make sure that those pHs are in in line. That's from a from a biological biology standpoint. From a tank mixture and, st and um, stability standpoint, if it gets too much out of whack, then you could start seeing precipitates developing into that mixture. Um, you know, if you're talking about a, making an application to uh, surfaces with a soluble liquid. Say for a pest control uh, perimeter pest application, you know these be absorbed into the surfaces and that possibly reduce the residue or residual control. You know, especially if you're you're trying to uh, um, control you know, ants or anything like that that crawl up onto the surface. Uh, suspension concentrates we talked about earlier. This is one that's. Uh, Fairly common. Uh, see a lot of suspension concentrates uh, on the shelf as you go into the, you know, the, the various dis distributor warehouses. These are um, formulations that basically have a solid active ingredient that they're dispersed in water. Okay, 
Um, they're not, they don't have any dust associated with them. They're fairly low odor um, and uh, a lot easier, a lot more friendlier to use than something like an emulsifiable concentrate or a wettable powder. Uh, so examples here from, from FMC would be Calstar Pro, uh, Dismiss or Fame SC, you know, fungicide or a couple of things. So those are the main things that we we're going to want to uh, focus on. We're talking about suspension concentrates. So, a lot of times that um, that you'll see <clears throat> um, in uh, in distribution is sometimes you might see a little bit of a bleed layer that product's been sitting for a while, uh, but typically, um, you know, that's not a that's not a bad indication of the formulations. Just needs to be agitated before you pour it in and then it goes on goes away um, so these are uh, this is an example of what we're talking about here typically you can be a lot higher percentage in your active ingredient compared to a soluble uh, product you know if you compared um, you know the percentages of something like a um, a, um, let's say a dismiss herbicide, you know, you, you look at the percentage of the active ingredient in that uh, product, you know, it's going to be a lot higher than solitaire WSL. Solitaire WSL is, is only about 6%, 6.6% 6 .6 active ingredient. Um, because if you put too much active ingredient in a soluble liquid, and that can overload the system and things start to fall out uh, of that formulation. Uh, not so with a suspension concentrate, you can go much higher um, because you've had these other adjuvants to keep that product uh, into uh, this, uh, this concentrate, keep it suspended. Um, and then we control, compare the, the true solution to a suspension concentrate as far as particle size goes. Obviously the suspension, because you have solid particles that is, are suspended in a liquid, then you, know, you have much larger uh, particle size here in this mixture, which is why it does um, require more agitation. So not as much agitation as say a wettable powder or a WDG, um, but certainly more agitation than a soluble uh, true solution formulation. So if, if you've ever seen the diagram with all the little bottles lined up with different formulations, you know, the wettable powder uh, is going to fall out the, the, the quickest. You know, the SC is going to take a lot longer uh, time to fill out and actually collect in the bottom, but eventually it will. Make sure you, you do have agitation with, with the suspension concentrates. Um, there are different types of emulsion that, that you may come in contact with. Uh, EC is an emulsifiable concentrate. And EW is an emulsion in water. Okay. Um, so an emulsion, uh, these are basically, you, know, you have a liquid that's dispersed in another liquid. So you can have the active ingredients dissolve, dissolved in oil and then mixed with an emulsifier. And that mixture is suspended in water, forming a white emulsion. Okay. Um, an example of an EW would be Quicksilver. Okay. That's an emulsion in water. An EC uh, formulation would be, you know, a lot of your a lot of your products that contain uh, esters. A lot of your some of your broadleaf wheat herbicides have that are, are ester formulations that are they're formulated in, in an EC. Some of your selective grass herbicides or, or, or products that have that are EC formulations. Um, they typically have a much stronger odor to them um, than a, a suspension concentrate, uh, but you know. 
these are situations where um, they do have a fairly high amount of active ingredient in these formulations, uh, but a couple of things that you know we need to be aware of is you know they they do have an odor. So an example of some some insecticides that we have baseline is a product that that's used a lot in in uh, as a perimeter application. It does have some 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 turf applications as well. Uh, they, you have these petroleum-based solvents as emulsifiers in these formulations, which is why you, you smell this odor. So you may have a, like a clean or clear look to it when it's in its raw form or straight out of the jug. But as soon as you mix it with water, it turns this creamy white. So that's kind of a one of the differences between an SC and an EC. SCs are typically, you know, white and they, they stay white. These aren't going to fall out of solution as quickly as, a, as an SC does. A couple of advantages, you know, because it's a liquid product, you know, there's, it's fairly easy to handle, little agitation. I would say, I mean, I think it's relatively easy on the equipment, but certainly there are some exceptions there that you have to be mindful of. Uh, and then you don't see a lot of residue once it's been, been applied. From a turf standpoint, one thing you do have to watch out for with these fun formulations are um, the turf tolerance. You know, there are, are plant injury, there are certain uh, products that, are, that can be more injurious um, especially, and I think that has a lot to do with the time of year it's been applied. So um, take, for example, comparing like an ester formulation to an amine formulation. Ester formulations are typically used in cooler parts of the year or times of the year. But once you start getting some heat to it and that summer heat starts coming along, that's when you start switching to amine formulations, especially with your broadleaf wheat herbicides. Um, you tend to see um, more uh, warning caution, uh, signal words with EC formulations because they can be easily absorbed by the skin. Um, and that translates into possible shipping issues. Um, and then uh, because you have these petroleum distillates and, and harder uh, uh, inert ingredients, you may run into situations where you have deterioration of you know, rubber and plastic hoses, washers and gas, et cetera. So there's some things to be mindful of. Um, you know, micro encapsulated encapsulated suspensions, we don't have a whole lot of these from a, from a herbicide standpoint in turf, but we do have these more so when you're dealing with uh, perimeter pest application type application for mosquito applications. Um, these are applications that are, or excuse me, active ingredients that are encased in an oil or polymer shell. Uh, and it's typically done to um, uh, do one or two things, uh, to protect that molecule from, from skin irritation. There are some uh, insecticides that can, that can cause some, some skin irritation or to extend the life of active, ing active ingredients under harsher conditions. You know, so we have a product called um, uh, Cyan UVX. So it's a really unique formulation in that it, it helps um, extend the, the, the life and the residual of that product under harsher environments you know, when you're making those mosquito applications. Uh, it's fairly low odor. Um, certain products you may have um, equipment where it can clog if not maintained properly. Um, so, uh, and that, that's just in general, not specific to sign on, but, um, you know, typically you'll get some kind of time release control. It's fairly stable on porous surfaces. Um, you may have some variability the rupture and the fracture upon mixing and applications. I guess it depends on the type of polymer shell that's being involved. Um, and in some situations, it may be more costly 
and, a, and an SC formulation just because of the technology involved in that formulation. Look at, uh, you may run into micro emulsions, uh, depending upon how involved you are with uh, certain aspects of the businesses, especially for the you know, pest control side of things, if you're into you know, doing perimeter applications, you know, you know, this is a product here, Transport Micron is one that we have that's on micro emulsion. So it involves a technology where it's a, it's a suspended liquid uh, where that active ingredient is suspended in specifically designed to increase biouptake and mixing uh, of that product and tank stability. So this is one where it doesn't exactly form a true solution uh, but it can really provide a really a nice uh, distribution of that formulation through the tank. Um, it mixes clear, it dries clear, there's no settling or clogging of, of screens, um, and um, very interesting uh, type of formulation. You look at this um, formulation in particle size, if you remember, when we were talking about um, that earlier in the, in the presentation, one particle of a suspension concentrate is equal to 100 to 1,000 micron particles. So if you think about this one circle being one suspended concentrate particle, this rectangle represents 100 to 1,000 micron particles. So that's one advantage of a microemulsion is you're getting a lot more uh, particles of that active ingredient over a, being applied over a given area uh, because it, you're dealing with much smaller particle sizes. So, um, you know, I think there's a couple of things there. There are advantages of that is that it certainly um, increases the coverage of that active ingredient over an applied surface. Um, but some of the disadvantages may be if it's you know uh, very similar to a say a soluble product, you may see some product some of these active ingredients because they're so small get down into a surface um, and it may not provide um, you know, the, the efficacy that it's there. But long term, you know, you know that's sort of one of the unique possibilities there is that you're able to deliver more active ingredient particles. Uh, to the target compared to a, something like an SC formulation. So that's where you get that increased performance and greater uptake. Um, you know, there's certainly still water dispersible granules or, or dry flowables out there. Uh, this is a product that is uh, a solid uh, where it's gone through some type of extrusion uh, process. It goes through an extruder. And you know, you, this is one where you like you have to have a scoop associated with it. A lot of sulfonylurea products, uh, herbicides are, are in water dispersible granule form. But then when you dilute it in water, uh, you get a sprayable uh, final product uh, that does need um, agitation. You know, back in the day, it was most of your uh, pre-emergence herbicides were. Um, it's water dis dispersible granules, uh, larger particle sizes are associated with this compared to some of the, the um, suspension concentrates. So I think in some ways, you know, coverage is important. You know, when you're, you're using a water dispersible granule, uh, so things like blind side, and we have solitaire WDG is an example of this. You have granular products out there, dust products, that's more of a pest control type of situation, but we do have granular products. Um, these are uh, products that would be something like a, you know, an echelon on, on fertilizer or, you know, you know, a towel star on the granule, that kind of thing. Um, they typically will have good residual. They have a much lower amount of active ingredient that are on these granules. Uh, but you need good coverage on a granular, right? So you need to make sure 
that you're getting enough coverage of that product uh, that's going to provide an even barrier of protection over that surface of the lawn that you're treating. Um, depending upon what type of granular it is, most granules do require some type of irrigation or rainfall to become activated. You know, you know, it doesn't matter if it's an insecticide on a granule or a herbicide on a granule, or even there's some fungicides on granules. You need to get that active ingredient off uh, of that particle in order for it to be effective. Um, these are some examples here. Um, advantages of some of the wettable powders we talked about. You, know, you typically will have good residual. Uh, very, it stands up nicely on porous surfaces if you're dealing uh, with, a, say, a perimeter pest application from a turf and landscape standpoint. <coughs> Excuse me. You uh, uh, typically will have very good results from a, from a soil stability standpoint with uh, wettable powders. Uh, the mixing really depends on, on uh, and measuring depends on the, the, the packaging and the formulation of parameters. So sometimes, believe it or not, there still are products that are, have water-soluble bags. Uh, that was designed initially to be a little bit easier to use because you're, you're not measuring things out. Uh, but more often than not, you're going you're gonna to deal with measuring um, the things out. And most companies will supply a, a scoop that has increments on, on the uh, scoop that goes back to the use rates on the label. Um, Compared to uh, some other uh, active ingredient formulations like ECs are relatively less harmful to plants and animals. And you don't have the absorption issues that you deal with uh, some of the ECs. Um, the disadvantages is you, you tend to have um, inhalation potential there because of the dust that it forms. You do have to have wettable, you have to have constant agitation can be difficult to mix in hard water. Uh, this is another issue uh, that you may see. Um, you have a lot of um, precipitates in the water. Could, could have a difficult time getting into that suspension. Um, and of course, the abrasiveness sometimes on, on your equipment can happen. Uh, granular materials, you typically don't have to to worry about um, some of these, but certainly the the, the dust dustiness of certain formulations can be an issue. Um, and then, uh, you know, if it's a sand-based granule or something like that, it can be fairly abrasive on certain uh, spreaders and things like that. So, just to summarize everything, just make sure you're you're choosing a pesticide formulation that suits your needs. Okay, that's going to fit what you do. You know, a lot of companies, they, they're, they're granular only uh, product uh, companies. They only make granular applications. Others do a mixture of both. So think about, you know, how you do your, you operate your business, the type of uh, target pest that you're dealing with, whether or not that uh, product is going to meet that need. Uh, you want to make sure it's going to be safe and easy to use. I can worry about human exposure concerns. Like I said before, you want to make sure we, that the tolerance is there and it's going to deliver the efficacy that you're expecting um, and that it works well with the equipment that you use. So uh, I hope that helps provide a little bit of um, a better clarity on a few things. There's a lot of different formulations out there. And I think that's about it right now. Hope everybody has a great weekend. Okay. Thanks again, Ken.